Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Black. I'm the assistant provost. I want to uh, thank FCLD for putting together this uh, workshop on plagiarism, and I know the uh, Faculty Senate has also been involved in these discussions, and I think we have several members from Faculty Senate presenting today. Um, I think this topic of plagiarism is particularly timely, given that we have new technologies that allow students to plagiarize, and we also have new technologies that can detect that plagiarism. But I'm also pleased to know that we're going to be talking about ways to prevent plagiarism today. And I think a lot of that has to do with educating our students about what plagiarism is and, and how they can prevent it. I just went to a um, conference last week, the Connecticut um, Educators Computer Association, SICA. Their keynote speaker was talking about one of the things he addressed was ethics. And what he said is that we really need to educate our students about respecting other people's information. In other words, information is property. And much like we wouldn't steal somebody's car, we wouldn't steal somebody else's information or information that they have created. And so I think some of this is educating our students that information is property and that they need to cite it appropriately and not steal it. So I'm very much looking forward to this seminar. Thank you to all of those who took time out of their day to be here. And I'll turn it over to Jane. Hi. Welcome to everyone. To get us started today, we have Don Jones, um, whom you all know as um, the director of our writing program and as the person who has put together the website that is, I think, a good place to begin for ideas. We probably could spend the next 90 minutes complaining about egregious cases of plagiarism, getting angry, getting frustrated, and that's probably not going to be very productive. For many students, except the most egregious plagiarists, and those are a different category, many students just don't know much about plagiarism for various reasons. I'm not talking about the student who's deliberately plagiarizing and trying to do as little work as possible. I'm talking about the students who simply don't know so much. Of course, as Catherine said, there's greater access to sources by the internet, which is making this much harder. There are you know, phenomenal increases being reported in academic dishonesty. And related to that, there have been some significant decreases in high school preparation. And there's also the issue of cultural diversity. So for roughly the next 10 minutes, what I want to do is talk about these issues. And what I'm really doing is modeling the type of conversations we all need to be having with our students. And I mean that all very inclusively, not just Rick Walker and Pat Morelli and I from RLC, but the same messages need to be heard in all the different court classrooms in some form or another. Our students are quite capable of saying, oh, I'll do it for Professor Morelli. She's the English teacher. For Professor Desplace, no, that's Barney. It doesn't matter. Just like I've heard students say to me, oh, grammar? Yeah, I'll do that for you. But it doesn't matter for my Barney or any of Professor Anstrom. It doesn't matter for my Pogo class because they compartmentalize, so we need to attack that problem. I also will say, this is nothing new, remember. Plagiarism's been going on, you know, for time in memoriam. We've got the original origin of the word. And, of course, in 1870, there were those literary gentlemen hanging around Harvard Yard sort of saying, hey, kid, you need a paper, and they would write it for them. But this is a new circumstance with the Internet. Okay. There have been dramatic increases reported, notice from 10% in 1999 of internet plagiarism to 41% in 2002. That's internet plagiarism. It doesn't mean that plagiarism wasn't happening prior, which is simply the older version of it. But it is an alarming trend. There also have been decreases in high school preparation, one because of excessive teaching loads and two because of high stakes mastery exams English teachers and social studies teachers have simply cut back or they've abandoned on the traditional term paper. English teachers, to be fair to them at the high school level, have to teach the five paragraph theme for the Connecticut Mastery Test, Massachusetts, and many other states. There's also the issue of cultural diversity. Students, for example, from less individualistic cultures such as China, they're taught to copy authoritative sources. Individual assertion and source citation are just not standard cultural practices for those students coming to this university. Some of the causes, I will argue, for many students are a matter just of sheer ignorance. They don't know any better. They haven't been taught. Obviously, poor time management is a problem. Writing anxiety is a problem. And it's also that they can engage in some pretty cynical rationalization. So we need to talk about all this with our student. We cannot just assume they should know it, that they do know it. 
we can all talk a bit about this, and that's what I'm going to model, as I said today. One, we need to talk to our students like the case I described of blatant copying is not okay. We need to tell our students that we can see this, because they're surprised that we can. Here's a sample sentence of the NAACP successfully campaigned for African Americans to be commissioned as officers. I took one look at that sentence and knew it was not student writing. And of course, you can do a Google search with that, and there are other ways to do it, and up pops the original source. Students need to be warned away from it. We know how to handle plagiarism. They're shocked that many of them, we can spot it so easily. Of course, it also happens because of accidental plagiarism just by poor note taking. And here's a sample from an actual student paper. The student began very well. Dismissing a tenure teacher usually requires that the school board hold hearings and there was the proper citation. And then these other sentences continued. In the hearings, the teacher is always considered innocent until proven guilty, just like in a criminal case. The burden of proof rests squarely on the administration. Again, I looked at those second and third sentence and said, this is not student writing. I said, bring your notes in. And of course, the student realized they had simply continued and taken from the source in those latter sentences. It wasn't their own elaboration because they hadn't very effectively recorded source information, page numbers. And I always tell students, put a cue where the quote is and then put me afterwards where the elaboration is so that they can separate where the source is and where their own work begins as this student hasn't done enough. Of course, students also can engage in what's called patchwork plagiarism. They just cut and paste from different sources. Here you see, I won't go take you through this completely, but a student source and another student sentence from the same paper, and all they did was lift from one source, lift from another source. It's a desperate kind of plagiarism. It's a little bit more deliberate than that accidental plagiarism caused by poor note taking. But he didn't have a sense of how to handle it better. So there are, of course, lots of paper mills. The first one has the lovely title of www.schoolsocks.com. And then there's places where you can exchange papers. You put a paper in and you can take one out, like cheathouse.com. This is a teachable moment if you show this to students. Show them the slogan of schoolsocks.com is download your workload. And they begin to get what the site is about. There's number 2855, Models of School Reform. It has 22 citations. It's an eight-page paper. And then there's a strange disclaimer at the end, if you notice. And this disclaimer is, all papers ordered through this site are owned by research associates. Papers are intended for research purposes only. All papers must be cited properly. And as you're smiling and laughing, that's exactly what students do, and they get it. They get the hypocrisy between the claim of, you know, it's just for research so help, and then you're downloading your workload. We need to show that we understand the extent of the problem, and we can then deal with it. That will prevent the lesser forms of plagiarism from happening, and even scare off some of the more egregious cases. So we need to teach them how to do it a bit better. We need to create some checkpoints. Rather than just give the assignment and wait eight weeks for it to come in, have a check on the topic, on the thesis, the careful notes, and so on. We need to talk about the writing process briefly and honor it in the sense that it involves collecting of materials, finding a focus, organizing, drafting, and revising. So have some moments to check the progress of that research paper, anything that's using sources beyond the classroom. And we can practice citation with our students. I know that Harold and everyone else in those content courses, you've got so much you need to do, but if you're assigning some research, I will beg you, take 20 minutes out of class, bring in, ask students to bring in their sources and notes, and practice with them briefly how you go from the notes to then paraphrase and quotation. And then you can say, I taught it to you. You need to be doing it properly. We can then teach search strategies to students. Most students do not understand what a sponsored link or a sponsored match is on something like Yahoo. They're paid placements, usually by .com sites or information. That simply, it's like cookies at the end of the supermarket aisle. And students need to know that. And, right, and they also need help figuring out what are the best you know, scholarly sources in a discipline. We cannot begin to do that for all the different disciplines in the RLC 111 class. That's something you'll have to do in your own two and 300 level courses. 
We also need to overcome student cynicism that everyone isn't doing it. We should bring up those controversial cases, say of Doris Kearns Goodwin, who of course was embarrassed but you know maintained her position. Of course, Richard Judd had to step down as the president over at Central, and Jason Blair had his journalistic career just ruined. Talk about this with our students. Tell them this matters. It is theft, as Catherine said, of other people's ideas, and it will ruin careers and academic careers. I think we also need to give them students some positive reasons for proper documentation. That really what they're doing, that student who didn't slip in the citations, it's a matter of not just avoiding the charge of plagiarism, but you're taking credit for your own thorough research. I looked at the source, I found this, there's the end of the source with the parenthetical citation, and then you elaborate after the parenthetical citation with your own critical thinking. It marks your work and other people's work. And then you'll be joining the club. You're learning how to talk like academics do, and that's what obviously a part of a univer university education is about, is joining that discourse community. We can teach citation conventions, not as rules, but just the way it's done right now. We can talk about medieval manuscripts that, of course, just were copied by scribes. There was no individual authorship. That's a development of the 19th century with copyright laws. We should talk to them about Napster sharing versus iTunes and how now artists are getting credit for the work that they've done unless they decide to distribute their music you know, for free. We can talk about the movement from footnotes to parenthetical citation and how much easier it is. If you imagine everyone in the room remembers doing the old numbered footnotes through the paper, you made one change, you had to then start renumbering and most of us retyping again on the old typewriter, remember that? And we can talk about MLA and APA not just as a solid rule, a rigid rule, but there's reasons for these different citation systems. APA, of course, for social scientists, that currency of the research from show the date of 2003 matters. If you're in English, you can use, you know, Leslie Field or from um, literature from an earlier time, and that's fine. So there's the difference in the citation systems. We want to let the students know there are reasons for what we're doing, and there are certain conventions. The last thing I'll say is if we do this, we can start to change student attitudes. The student in one of my 111 courses wrote, I learned to become an authority. Understanding this issue instead of just copying words was a major challenge that I completed. Comfortably and confidently, knowing the issues surrounding my topic, I could finally speak the specialized language and make arguments. I learned not just to write about an issue in today's society, but to really understand it and tell others my opinion. And that's what we're trying to get them to do with research-related papers. Last thing I'll offer is just some further sources. A lot of what I've done is on the RLC website under research strategies. Of course, this presentation, if you're quickly taking notes, is, will be posted on the FCLD site. There's the information skills tutorial on the library's homepage. There's also a comprehensive list of resources on the faculty services, and you'll see that there. And as again, all those uh, URLs are available on this presentation on the FCLD list, and there's my own list of sources. Our next speaker, speaker is Michelle Troy of the English Department at Hillier, who's going to give us some ideas about assignments that can make a difference. Thank you. We're talking early on here about prevention as a part of the cure, um, and so I'm, as, as Jane said, I'm going to focus on assignments. Um, I teach literature and writing classes, so the assignments that I'm drawing from are, are the examples I'm drawing from are necessarily from my discipline, but I'm, I want to try to um, generalize from those at different points so that maybe we could open up the question of strategies in assignments that could work across disciplines. Um, for me, one of the things that has worked best as I shift back and forth between literature and writing is um, realizing that the more students uh, the more I create, create assignments where I ask students to follow professional models, the more that seems to work. The more I can get them to identify with, say, what does a professional writer do? What does a professional literary critic do? Um, the more they seem to take pride in the work that they're doing, they're a little more willing to spend more time on it. They come see me more for revisions. Um, if I send them out and just say, do an interpretation of Great Expectations, I'm going to get, or Frankenstein, um, uh, I'm, I had to finally stop teaching Frankenstein. I was so tired of teaching, of getting plagiarized papers. And until I can come up with another way, 
of another kind of assignment. Um, um, so in any case, um, this idea of creating assignments that play off of professional models, just to give you some examples from my composition class, um, I use printed writing as well as radio essays in my writing classes. And one show that I use quite frequently is This American Life, which is on NPR. Every week there's a new theme, and there are several essays related to that same theme. So one assignment I do is have students gather together and create their own radio show. Each paper is graded individually, but they have to come together and brainstorm an idea for a show. And I have them look. There are a lot of creative ideas for shows um, on the website of This American Life. And they there's something about that process of them choosing you know, within certain parameters, um, them getting to do something that feels remotely professional rather than just like, oh, Troy's having us do this, you know, paper, um, that seems to help. I've had very few incidences of plagiarism. I've had a higher level of investment on that project. Um, another example, this past fall, I had them work off of the show This I Believe. Well, you know, there there's a question of personal belief at stake. If they sure they can go try to copy that off of someone else's website, but I don't. They, they again, that was a, a situation where I, I really didn't feel like there was a problem with plagiarism, and I I took that um, to another level with the help of a couple of SCLD grants last fall and had students actually record one essay that from the course for the semester, um, and that I've never seen students put so much time in on, on an essay before. And certainly, you know, if they're going to play that back for their family, as some of them said they did, they want that work to be their own. They want to be able to say, I did this, Mom. Yeah, I did this, Dad. Um, so one possible way to adapt this ideal of, idea of professional models across disciplines, I think, is just to think about what the codes are for your own discipline. I was thinking in particular about history. Um, here we have, you know, art and chemistry and various other disciplines represented here. but. Um, for example, you know, what do historians do? Well, historians, we, they analyze artifacts. They look at manuscripts. They, they weigh the evidence, um, sometimes competing forms of evidence. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to give students, say, samples from manuscripts or, um, time permitting, take them over to the Connecticut Historical Society, but that's, I know, more in depth. But even if you were just to call a few excerpts and say, okay, if you were a historian looking at this document, what would this tell you about this time period? Why would this contain important information? How would you link this with the stuff we're talking about in the textbook? And even if that manuscript excerpt and the textbook were the only sources, students would be much, potentially much less likely to, to plagiarize there. Um, I did a paper at one point in an advanced comp class where we read the first book of Spiegelman, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, his graphic novel Mouse, and then students had to interview someone in their family about a historical event and then do the historical research behind it. And again, there's something about that personal investment that seemed to make a difference there. Students would come to me and they would say, um, I found this great source, but I want to make sure I'm quoting it correctly. Um, and that, I'd, had plenty of, I'd had plenty of students do research papers before, but there was something about that research paper where I was getting, you know, do students really want to, if they're going to show that paper again, you know, they're interviewing dad about Vietnam, do they want to go back and, you know, <laughs> show dad this paper that they've only partly written. Again, there seems to be something um, there about the professional model that, in, in combination with the personal investment maybe that, that helped. Um, I would say an, another kind of assignment that I've started to use um, in my literature classes is from a guy named Sheridan Blau, who's been teaching out at University of California Davis for years. Um, and he did a great book called The Literature Workshop, and in that he's talking about trying to get students much more engaged in, um, in, in just the reading and interpretation of literature and to get past that intimidation factor. I tend to get the most plagiarized papers in my literature classes where students they just don't know where to start. There's a paper he designed called The Interpretation Project that I think could be widely adapted across, say, you know, economics, um, and, and other fields, anywhere where, as you were saying, there are these club expert conversations where the experts act a certain way and they do certain things. Um, and what it does is it groups, it's, you put students into groups, they get to choose, you give them a list of, say, six texts. In my class, it's, I might give them a Rossetti, Christina Rossetti poem, a Matthew Arnold poem, a chapter from Lewis Carroll. You know, I have six different, five or six different options. Um, they can choose which one they want to write about. These are not texts we've necessarily covered in class. We may have covered, say, a Matthew, a Matthew Arnold poem or two, but not that particular one. Students then each write their own paper on that, um, on that 
text come into class and you let them gather in their group that, that first, that one class day and just talk about it. They talk about their ideas, they swap ideas within their group. How did they understand, how did you understand that? What did you make of this part? And part of, that's the day the draft is due. You give them another week and the final version of the paper is due. In the final version, one of their jobs is to quote from someone else's paper in their group. So they use the other students' papers as the expert opinions. They're not going to outside sources necessarily. And I'm finding that for my 200 level classes in Hillier, it's a really, it's been a really worthwhile sort of experiment because it also is an assignment that foregrounds that process of borrowing. And you, Catherine, you were talking about this um, can, this conference you just went to where they're talk students need to understand ideas as property. And there's nothing like that if, you know, Joe is sitting across from me and he's got, you know, Mary's sitting over there and I'm using ideas from their paper and I don't cite them. I know that person. That person's in my world. And there's something about that I think that has also been um, somewhat helpful. Um, I think the, the last kind of example I would give is a paper where there's a real world component. Um, I've had students go to the Wadsworth Museum or the Joseloff and play art critic, for example, you know, choose for descriptive writing, choose one work that does something for you and sort of, you know, evaluate this work. Um, I did a variation for my literature class. I did Wads Wordsworth at the Wadsworth <laughs> this time around with the romantic paintings coming back. So instead of having students do um, write me a paper about a Wordsworth poem or Wordsworth's, you know, what makes Wordsworth a romantic, I had them go choose a painting that they thought Wordsworth would like out of one of these two exhibits. And they had to prove that he would like it by going back to his poetry. Um, one more quick example like that, be, I did Be Wild in Your World, which I still see the results of. But um, Oscar Wilde, you know, being a social critic, what from his play, what idea would be relevant today? What issue or idea, how do we know that? What evidence would you offer? What evidence from the play can you show me that shows that Wilde subscribed to a particular kind of idea? So um, these are just some things, again, I think that, you know, if you have a philosophy class and you're asking, you know, you could ask students to be reading the paper and evaluate something according to what a philosopher would think of it. I'm just, so I think there are ways to adapt these. Um, the final, I just want to close up by saying, reiterating what Don said, which is that um, you can't, <laughs> I mean, there are, there are students who will plagiarize regardless. And some of these very assignments I've mentioned to you, um, I've had students plagiarize. And a, a couple of the ones, the one I mentioned by Sheridan Blau, I had one student paraphrase the entire paper of her peer in the group. It's only happened once since I've done the assignment, and I've done it for multiple years now. But, um, yeah, claiming that she didn't know that that was a problem. She thought they were supposed to use other people's ideas. So, and we had signed an honor code in the class before that, stating, you know, I understand that paraphrases can be plagiarizing, all these different forms. So. There's no real rationale. And the radio show assignment, I had a student, um, students had decided they were going to do college vices. And um, what I had one student who chose as the vice he was going to write about plagiarism. Well, wouldn't you know, he plagiarized from the promotional website for turnitin.com. <laughs> so it, if you're not going to stop everyone all of the time. But um, I do think this issue of, there, there are some ways we can, we can try to prevent it. I think the other issue, as you were talking about, was Ignor um, getting, educating students about it. And to that end, I can talk about this more in the question and answer if anyone's interested, but Hillier has, um, through the um, initiative of Dean Ald Assistant Dean Aldera and Dean Goldenberg and some faculty, designed an academic integrity workshop that is mandatory now for students during orientation. So those students attend it, the workshop, they sign a sheet saying, I understand plagiarism is X, Y, and Z. It goes in their file, and later on as a professor, if you have any trouble, you go to the student file and you can pull that out and say, you know, well, this says you knew. So in any case, um, I'll pass on the baton. Our next speaker is Randy Ashton Critting. The University Libraries has been a partner with faculty members for years on plagiarism and copyright issues. In the past years, when everything was in paper form, it was a little more difficult to track down sources. It was very time consuming. Now with the internet, it is faster. I'm not going to talk about turn it, 
in .com, but some of the other sources at the library office. And Don referred to it earlier. And what Lorella is handing out is not only Kitty Tynan's business card, if you have further questions, uh, but a, uh, copies of what I'm about ready to talk about. Everybody knows the university library pages. On here is a plethora of information, especially for faculty, graduate students, undergrads. And many of you may even know these at the moment. But down here, where it says user services, there's a section here for faculty. Click onto it. You'll notice that over on the right-hand side is a plagiarism web source. A lot of these are free sources that the library has been tracking for the number of years. Some of them are paid commercial sites. You'll see that we even have a um, uh, link to the turnitin.com. But what I would like to talk about is the University of Maryland's page. Oops, and you'll even have a sample on here. And I'm going to show you how this works. Okay, just brought up Google. I type in cats and dogs. Very simple. Something the kids do all the time. They do their searches. Uh, let's go to the stomach bugs, just for kicks and giggles. And literally, I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to paste it into the University of Maryland's site. Very simple. I did this with a letter uh, that I was writing to my Mortensen board the other day, just, for, just to see what would happen. Just my own personal letter. But it was interesting, because Lorel asked me this question, how does it work? Is it like turnitin.com? Do they actually archive the papers? Well, they didn't. I tried it last week. I tried it several times today with the same paper, my, my same letter, and it did not come in. So from the cats and dog off of Google, up comes possible plagiarisms. And basically, just click onto the results section, up comes the site. So it's telling you there's a problem. And you can do that with any of the, the sentences here. Very simple. Now, I also tried it earlier with foreign um, papers. It also matched up with plagiarism or no results. So when you go back to the site, this is where it differs from turnitin.com. I clear it. It's gone. It's absolutely gone. There is no archiving. So the legal cases with turnitin.com may not be affected by this particular site. There are other uh, sites on the uh, page for faculty for under plagiarism that also may be able to help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So will that only work for something that was on the web? Obviously, it's you not have work to work for the. You have to cut and paste it in. No, okay. I did my own letter. I've done um, okay. um, another piece that I was working on just to double check. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Um, next, we have. David Displace, um, who is from, aren't you going together? Oh, okay, sorry. I was told, I was, I was told, I have directions here, and they tell me that I'm introducing you both at once, but. Um, Narader Samukadis, did I not brutalize that too much? Well, okay. I'm used to it. Okay, who is the Associate Professor of Management at the Varney School? Narader, yes. I'm going to be shuffling a few papers, so I'll, I'll find myself some space here. I'm here representing the Faculty Senate, as is David Deplas. I'm here specifically to talk about the Faculty Senate and some of the initiatives we're taking uh, with regard to plagiarism and academic dishonesty more, more so. And David Deplas is, the, is chairing the uh, Student Affairs Committee. I'm chairing the Technology and uh, Computer and Technology Committee for the Senate. And I just thought, thought we'll brief you on some of the initiatives we are undertaking. And David will talk more about the Student Affairs Committee. Uh, online cheating is, is a huge problem nowadays. I and mean, I, I don't think I have to tell you about the number of articles that are out there talking about how many people are cheating online and all sorts of problems. But I, the first two speakers, Don and uh, Michelle, really made the point over here that there's lots, of, lots to be done in terms of prevention that can prevent a lot of these problems. And it's really only the most egregious cases that we have to deal with in terms of trying to catch them. 
even the others that are not egregious cases, it may be a question of, if not prevention, it's a question of guiding them because it was a, a, it was a mistake. Somebody did not know what to do. Uh, those are different cases completely. And I picked up an article as I was searching through, guess where, on the internet I searched, and I found an article that was interesting. He says, four reasons to be happy about internet plagiarism. And this professor goes on to say that internet plagiarism is really a good thing if you look at it because it's teaching us what we should be doing right. And one of the things he's saying is, he says, the institutional rhetorical writing environment, that is the research paper, is challenged by this, and that's a good thing. He says, where in the world do you get people to actually go out and do things like this in the real world? We're making them do something artificial, and people are revolting on that, and if we need to fix that, it's telling us we need to fix that. And he says, if I was taking a course in improving my golf swing, uh, would I be worried about cheating? I, that would be the last thing on my mind. But bec it's because it's not something that's real to me that I'm, I'm really not interested in it, and therefore I'm doing it for somebody else's sake. And pretty much the only reason I'm doing it is for, you know, to be a my morals, it's a moral uh, situation. You have to do that for that purpose. But other than that, there is no purpose to do that because I don't see any relevance to me. Uh, when we as faculty do research and we cite something, we're talking, thinking more in terms of, I mean, if I'm, I think Michelle said, we're, talk, we're talking to the same group that we're talking about. If I submit a paper to a journal, I want to make sure that I've done my homework and I want to make sure that I've cited everybody because guess what, if I submitted this paper to somebody, chances are the, the reviewer, one of the reviewers is, is one of those people whom I have cited. So I want to make sure that I have cited them properly. There is something in it for me. And also my purpose in citing it at that point is not so much to he says there's a positive aspect of it. One positive aspect is I want to show that I've actually done my homework and I'm adding to it. So I want to put myself in a good light. So in that sense, it's not so much the negative aspect of where when you ask a student to cite things, they are citing things not to show that they've done their homework, but they're citing it to prove that they have not copied. And that is an entirely different way of looking at the same thing. But uh, much as I am enamored by his comments, etc., when it comes to really can I, how can I fix this going on in my classroom? I am at a loss, just as anybody else. I, I do try to set some projects where they have to go and catch a real world company and say, okay, talk about this. And I make sure that you cannot pick from this list of companies that students have gone to in the past two years in my class. And I, I, that fixes a lot of problems in terms of the reports that they write to me. But there are a lot of instances where I say, okay, here are some number crunching problems. You have to learn how to do this plus this equals that, and solve some problems. And I say, you have to learn Excel. And I go through the process and tell them, instruct them how I learning Microsoft Excel or learning this tool or that tool is very important to them in, out in their careers. And they say, yeah, yeah, and then guess what? Some of them still plagiarize. And I just had a situation last week when I had two students hand in the exact same documents. And I look at this and I say, well, we made this on Microsoft Visio. We drew this diagram. And I said, if the same individual drew the two diagrams at two different points in time, they would not look that alike. And, but these are some of the things that are going to happen. And also, when you're talking about, I'm thinking of a typical Barney student who takes four years of classes. Two of those years they're taking in the Barney school, and very few of those classes they can actually relate to, to their major or discipline. So most of the courses they're taking over here over the four years are some things they cannot really relate to as the end point. So how are we as faculty going to then somehow make this real world to them? That poses a much greater challenge on us. And that is the dilemma. I mean, we can think about restructuring the courses, restructuring the syllabus, restructuring the entire uh, curriculum across the board, but that is only going to fix some of the problems. There are still some people out there who are going to engage in these kinds of behaviors. Coming to the question of what should we do as, as a university? Are we responsible? And here's a, 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 an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. I only have the abstract, but it says, British student says university was negligent for not stopping his plagiarism. <coughs> and, he <sued> the <coughs> and he sued the university. He says, but I always use the internet, cutting and pasting stuff and matching it with my own points, he continued. It's a technique I've used since I started the course. I never dreamt it was a problem. And he's suing the university for not teaching him that it was a problem. So from that point of view, we are negligent if we do not teach them. But is it enough if we teach them in an RLC course and do not follow up with the rest of the, the, the program all throughout? And I, I'm not sure if this guy actually won the, uh, uh, the case, because if he had won the case, I'm sure we would have all known about that. <laughs> but it, it certainly makes an interesting point out there. There are a lot of different ways of dealing with plagiarism. And one person over here wrote in in the Chronicle of Higher Education. He says, what should I do? Fail the person for the course, 
fail for that paper or allow the person to remain or give them an opportunity to rewrite the paper. And this basically it gets down to the point of if you, if you let a person off easy uh, and they are one of these egregious types, they don't learn the lesson, they come back and repeat it, and they do it 40 times, and now you have 40 second chances, and nobody knows. So this person came up with an idea, which I'm sure many have talked about, I'm sure David is also going to talk about this, is that we need to have a system in place where if somebody does something, it goes into the record, even if it doesn't affect them and give them an F or go something, some dramatic uh, response, but it is something that should prevent them from doing it again. The, the Here is an article from the politics in, from the Journal of Political Science and Politics. And this was in 2001. We have a couple of professors from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, worried about internet cheating and everything. And they, uh, they decided to conduct a, an experiment. And they said one professor would go in and just exhort the students not to do cheating and it's not a good thing and so on. Another person would actually go and use this, uh, one of the tools that uh, Randy showed, the EVE, what's that? The oh. No, the, the, on the university's website, you had the, one of the links was EVE something. I forget what it was. Like turn it in .com, it's one of the... Uh, it, yeah, it means it, it stands for something. It's an acronym for something. I might have that somewhere here. Okay. So they used that one, and they figured out that, guess what? The title of the article is, Actions Do Speak Louder Than Words. Deterring Plagiarism with the Use of Plagiarism Detection Software Works. So this, the people that they went and talked to and said, you know, you should not do this and so on and so forth, it didn't matter to them. They went and did it anyway. And this was not at the University of Hartford. This is at Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So that's a different breed of students, and even they happily do that. But the class in which they actually were caught and they were told that this thing, there were consequences, they were not penalized. They were penalized very leniently because they were not warned about it. But then the second time around, they submitted, and there was a big difference. The first class, there was no difference between the first submission and the second submission. It was just warning. The second class, there was a huge difference. And the only one person who repeated it was the person who wasn't paying attention and didn't realize after so many warnings that they were going to be scrutinized. So scrutiny does work. And so what are some of the things we can do? And Randy did point out many of the cheaper alternatives, such as even simple Google will find things for you. And a lot of the things that are listed on the, on the university library's website, these are things that are available very cheaply. Uh, one of the tools that we are looking into at the Faculty Senate uh, Committee was Turnitin.com. What is the difference between Turnitin.com and these other things? I think the, the big difference is if you have a solution provider, who has a larger database which is being updated, that would make for a big difference between, okay, if I go into Google and search and it's not updated as frequently, and Turnitin is updated more frequently with the relevant kinds of material, that would make it much more useful. But then the question we need to ask is, is it worth the cost? When I have Google for free and all of these search engines available for free, versus or the University of Maryland's website, et cetera, available for free versus Turnitin.com, uh, I believe the, the price was something in the range of $6,000, $8,000 per year. Uh, depending on the number of students we have and the usage, it could go up. Uh, and if we want to integrate that with Blackboard, it does add up to the cost. The question is, how many people are we going to, are we going to use it for that price? How many faculty members are actually going to use it for that price? And we still don't have a sense of that. Uh, another reason why Turnitin.com may not be, well, it may not be useful because of the price, but it may be useful simply because if it makes it much easier for integrating with Blackboard, let's say I have all my students submit their assignments or their papers via Blackboard, and it is integrated with the, the university is considering now upgrading to the, the, upgrading the version of Blackboard, which would allow integration with Turnitin.com. In that case, it would be a seamless process. The students submit their, uh, their papers right into Blackboard. It goes into a screen that looks like Turnitin.com. They submit their papers, and the report comes to the instructor. And let me show you what it, it looks like. Here's what you do. You submit a paper, evaluate the paper, it, it view, and then you view the report. And this is what the report looks like. Here, it seems to be pretty impressive. Like, it tells you over here, here is the paper your student submitted, and here is the paper that it's likely to be copied from. And it points out passage by passage, a lot of different things over here. It makes your life really easy as, as an instructor. 
And if this is now so easy for an instructor to use, would it then be used more often by instructors rather than going to Google? Because if Google or the other things are, <coughs> firstly, it's not very user friendly. Secondly, it, what are the chances of my actually catching somebody? Uh, maybe, maybe not. How useful is that? Now, this one really makes your life much easier because the student submitted, there is no upfront work for you. Students submitted on Blackboard just as, as they would another ordinary paper. Uh, and you just go and view this report, and it tells you the overall similarity index is 94%. It says, here are the things that match up, and here are the sites. It pretty much tells you exactly where the things came from. Just as Randy was saying, the other search engines would do that. It, this is just much more user-friendly, and also they update their database. But the downside is the cost, and those are the kinds of things we're looking at. Okay. Uh, I guess to follow up on Narendra's uh, discussion, um, Jared Katricius, who's the chair of the Faculty Senate, uh, came with a great idea of the two of the major issues that we have on campus, and one of them being uh, the issue of plagiarism. Uh, what is also fairly interesting is, although Narendra um, pointed out the technology side of it, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding as to what student affairs and what academic affairs is. And what, what we're coming up to realize is that actually universities are hill designed to actually handle academic issues. Student affairs is usually the one that handles all misconducts for the students. However, if you go and see Lee Peters and say, I have a student who's plagiarizing in my class, what does he say? I'm going to be the advocate for the student. I am not going to be the person who actually process and play, actually educates and so forth. There's no system on a overall, I'm not talking just the University of Hartford, I'm talking about universities overall have not been designed okay, to truly deal with, and also in this case is to record, educate, and eventually deal with issues of academic, and the reason is, is because we operate under a silent kind of design. We're going to see a student, what are the chances you'll be seeing that student again? Except if it's maybe in a major, you know, for example, for the Entrepreneurial Studies program at the Barney School of Business, I might see some students maybe two or three times, and that's just a few students, okay? But most of you are going to be seeing students one or twice, and that's it. Let's say you have an incident of a plagiarism, what do you do? You might document it, okay? You put maybe a letter in the file if you take that step. But beyond that, there's no other steps. And just imagine if you actually have a student who transferred from one school to the other, okay? You don't see the files usually moving from one school to the other. There are some steps taken to actually improve that. So I think what, and, and again, all of the panelists have actually, I think, pointed out that plagiarism or the element of cheating or unethical behavior has become a mockery from politics, okay, uh, everybody's playing the game, certainly we're seeing it on the advertising of the ads, the playing of the, the game, the words, have you is it there, are they themselves properly citing in the context, uh, I think they're taking it to a different extreme. Uh, I, I cannot remember one instance that made me laugh because we all, and maybe we're preaching to the choir, to the group of people who are here today, that faculty members complain that students are unethical or they are actually uh, cheating in the classroom or, or on assignments and so forth. Uh, there was a group of graduate students at MIT at a science and a technology conference, a really nationally or internationally well-known conference, who submitted a paper using four most cited papers in the field, cut and pasted, submitted it, and got accepted. Okay, and pointed out afterwards, and then designed it as a joke to say, you know, people who are supposedly reviewing people, and the reviewers were supposedly well known, and nobody caught on to it, okay? Uh, so I think we have to realize, yes, there is a problem. We have to deal, I think, with exactly what Don said, educate, educate, educate. I think half of the problem is, is if we're going to spend our time thinking that it's an issue of enforcement, one is that it'll be lost battle, <laughs> and two is that we're missing the the point of what our major function is, is to really work with the students. And I think they're going to point out something that's interesting, that what are we doing to follow through? Because if it's a silent mentality, what are we doing at a systems level? Uh, a recent study, which is very interesting because a lot of people associate ethics, and again, ethics, not just plagiarism, because it will eventually bleed into that. I think we can make that assumption, that ethics is an issue of business. Okay, a recent study that just came out showed that 57% of MBA students, 5,000 of them at 32 schools in the U.S. and Canada, said that they cheated. And this was reported in the news, made the business week. But what was not also emphasized enough 
was 46% of other non-business degrees reported of actually also engaging in cheating and unethical behaviors in the classroom. We're not talking about, so obviously, yes, obviously there is a difference and an alarming difference between business and non-business discipline. But I think what we have to point out is that we have a societal issue. A similar study was done in Chicago where 30, um, sorry, 97% of businesses in Chicago, business owners, reported that being ethical is very important for them as well as the interaction with their customers. 37% of high school students in the Chicago area said that it was important. The rest felt that it wasn't. So we're talking about a gap, certainly not gener only generational, but certainly there is a problem, and certainly for some of us, and this is a recent study, so these are the students who will be about to come <laughs> to the University of Hartford and other schools. So what can we do? Um, I think as far as universities and professors, I think one is to have a discussion. So I think we're engaging in that and having that. But faculty senate and certainly other entities working with the provost office and others to try to have a, uh, to realize that it has to be fully integrated. Integrated as far as we need to follow through on, for example, when we first heard about it in the RLC, but eventually have a segment. Because very interesting, many of the times, and I actually conduct ethics study uh, actually at the University of Harvard and other places, and I will tell you one thing that's alarming. 70% of the students said they've witnessed on that. I'm not going to ask them if they cheated personally. I said 70% of the students said, graduate and undergraduate students said that they actually cheated, uh, they actually, they witnessed, I'm sorry, cheating uh, in the last 12 months. Okay? Studies have shown that there is a link between what people see as their peer behaviors and their own personal uh, actual actions or possibly lack of or possibly cheating. Okay? I will also tell you that. There is a little gap, 45% of the faculty witness unethical behavior in the classroom, okay? But I will also tell you that, you know, there is unethical behavior witnessed by also faculty of their colleagues, which also a concern. And it has to do with the culture. How can we change the culture? Because it's not about just the enforcement. It's not about necessarily making, documenting, and so forth. Because it takes a lot of time. I mean, I have an incident of cheating in every single sub semester in mostly all the classes, but I take the time to write a letter. I take the time to talk to the appropriate dean if it doesn't fall within the Barney School of Business. And I can tell you, it takes me like uh, five hours between using the right word of the map and the source and talking to my department chair and saying, these are the steps because there's a due process for documenting and eventually giving a student the option of either refuging or not. And some of them have led to people actually quitting the class or being withdrawn. Uh, but and some of them, you know, they've learned supposedly their lesson. Uh, but I've also heard faculty members, for example, who just don't want to take the step to actually write that letter, which is time-consuming effort. And some of them feel that, why would I do that? Because if it goes back, you know, it's going to be on my record. People can go out and complain to the dean of students or the provost, and it's going to be he said, she said, and so on. Well, you know, this is our job, I think. And thank, well, we have to kind of take the, the responsibility of, of what is it that we can do. So. At the organizational level, the, the faculty senate, hopefully working with the technology uh, committee as well as the academic affairs committee, is to then have a discussion with, and Lee Peters at Student Affairs is extremely interested in engaging the dialogue to see how he can use his expertise of, again, judicial system, is creating a similar kind, parallel, uh, coming out of provost's office, not to give any work to uh, the people over here, uh, but to eventually find a way of us to actually truly documenting and, and publicizing what are the numbers, you know, are we on the ups, are we on the down, how are we dealing with it, how many of them have been just documented, uh, have actually been, not necessarily prosecuted, because this is not the environment that we're in, but eventually that deal with that. Uh, and, and there are some steps, and, and again, it has to do with this issue of organization. So we have to deal with it. So I think the process is, one is realization. We have to make students realize that, and again, a lot of them are, they did not know, truly. It's an issue of education. So that's the first step, and I think we can get rid of a lot of them. The second one is eventually this issue of investment. I think you hinted to that, is that to be invested in the assignments. One of the issues often cited by students is that exams never change. The versions don't change, the questions don't change, and that again is not, I mean, by the way, yes. The fact that they took the step to cheat and cut and paste and take it from somebody else and eventually take a, that is, you know, besides just the cheating, the plagiarism, what's well, there, what well, doesn't belong to you. Educate them, uh, so that's the first step. But the next step eventually is the outcome and the consequences. The outcome is in, hey, look at that. You are now, you know you know the content, you can speak to the content, you really have ownership of that assignment, uh, so you make it more interactive and so they feel good about it. And that could be anything. 
I have often discussions with my faculty members, or the, the Barney School of Business, in, in, and this has happened also a lot at other schools that I've been associated with, where I tell them, hey, you know, can you uh, complete the survey that I do about courses? And some of them say, well, I teach in this discipline, you know, what does ethics have to do with it? <laughs> And I say, you know, if you're teaching statistics, if you're teaching, you know, you know, and, you know, and at another school, not here, I've had even one law professor come in and says, well, this is what the whole course is about. I said, would you teach business law? That's not business ethics. So for a professor in law, and again, this is not associated with this university, so I want to preface that this is not a colleague. But, but again, it has to do with us as a, as a, as a university, as a community, uh, because we're very, I'm very involved as far as working with student affairs to create this kind of like pillars of of, of our society, what is it? What are the five or ten principles that this unit? And I hope that this is a process we're engaging in. That one of them will come out that we have to ethical in any way, form, or shape. Needs to come up as one of them. Uh, so this is a process that we'll be engaged in uh, eventually. Uh, uh, next, uh, some of the things that a lot of people complain about as far as um, this issue of ethics, especially in our MBA program. Well, we do a lot of group work. And again, we do not tell them what the limit is of group interaction. So I think our syllabi need to actually reflect that. It says, guess what? This is acceptable. This is not acceptable. Okay? And so that at one point, they need to understand that that, that, that limit was, that was kind of like outlined to them. And then there's, uh, and then the other one, that, which is the last, is this issue of honor code and academic workshop. It's very nice to see that, for example, Hilliard uh, has kind of a process. We don't have a systematic one at the university in, in part of orientation. There are schools, for example, that have taken the steps that convocation, which unfortunately is not well attended by our freshman students, is that students are required to raise their hands and actually pledge, okay, which is really giving a message that the president and eventually the provost or other people, not that they don't take care of, you know, but that, that, that we're looking, because a lot of schools, of mine teaches at the Coast Guard Academy. I mean, that's part of who they are from the first six months or uh, six weeks or eight weeks of, of indoctrination that they have, but they have to sign a statement. But we don't do that systematically, and we don't have a way of telling them going back. Uh, so half of them can play the ignorance game, and I think we have to work on that so that we catch it early, and then eventually we'll deal with the 5% that are problematic, the ones who truly will take, like, we, there have been cases where people took dissertations, entire dissertations and have actually submitted it to their committee, saying this is our work, this is my work. Um, because it was a dissertation that was never done or submitted online. It was something that was done in the 1970s. Uh, but they, what it is interesting is they found out uh, a year and a half because somebody published it on the dissertation abstract and then eventually said, whoa, whoa, this is something I did. And by the way, this was something that was taken off the shelf at Harvard. Okay, so obviously, you know, how do we deal with this issue of mockery about it? Well, we as a community eventually is to work with it. And this faculty center will take some steps, certainly beside the discussions that we'll have today. Any one of you who have comments that like to see things happen on the policy, uh, certainly you can approach me, approach Narender, and then Joanna is also in a person who's uh, key on the center. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, this has been extraordinarily informative. My job is, is supposedly to summarize, but let me just do that in about 30 seconds, offer a commercial, and then open up for questions. Um, I think what you've heard today falls in three categories. Uh, the issue of preventing plagiarism, which is obviously where we need to begin. And I think we heard from almost everyone how important it is to educate our students about plagiarism. And I think to get them to take themselves seriously as scholars, and to get them to, um, and for us to be creative in our assignments so that students are doing things that feel real and that feel meaningful and that where cutting and pasting is simply not an option. Um, I think we also heard that we have far more resources available to um, find evidence of plagiarism than perhaps many of us knew. Um, I'd like to add one quick one that has often worked for me over the years, and that is when I have a student who I am quite sure has plagiarized a paper, but I haven't found evidence of it, I will often call the student in, ask the student to write a summary of the paper in their own words. Well, to write a summary of the paper, I don't say in their own words. And most often, I think I've done this probably 50 times, and only once has it not worked. Um, in most cases, students say, I can't do that, and then I say, why not, and you get to a confession of some sort, so let me throw that out. Um, the third thing I think we heard today was the need for university 
wide policies and I think for some effort to change the culture th so there is respect for academic integrity um, and also so there are consequences for, um, for, uh, for serious egregious cases of plagiarism. So I think those are all issues that we can discuss today. I am delighted that it's the faculty that seems to be taking the lead on on this particular issue. I saw a headline in the Yale Daily News last week that said Dean's um, call forum on plagiarism. Um, and there was Academic Integrity Week um, that was described that sounded like not too practical in terms of uh, the information that was presented. And now for your questions. Yes, Larry. Every freshman has to take an English course. Um, is it possible to have a discussion near the beginning of the course of plagiarism and require a paper to be written about why um, plagiarism is not a good idea? An unplagiarized paper, of course. <laughs> <laughs> do either of our English professors want to answer that? We do discuss plagiarism in RLC 110 and then more especially in RLC 111. I'm happy to report that there's a new volume available. The RLC students receive a packet of textbooks and we have been giving students a different guide and now there's a new guide out called Avoiding Plagiarism which we're going to ask every student to purchase for the spring course. How will it exactly be implemented into the course we haven't quite determined but it will be part of the continuing discussion. This will be a particular guide every student I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that each student write a paper about uh, plagiarism because um, that uh, makes them take the effort and, and to have to integrate it into their own head. Yeah. Or there's the option that Hillier's doing with that code that they sign off on. I, I used to... Um I'm not sure about the the writing the paper in the in the course thing just we we haven't done that but I know we we ran into a kind of problem with uh, where we had every English professor I knew was doing um, some sort of workshop on plagiarism very early in the semester trying to educate students about it and I think there was that issue of perception that it's um, it's not a part of the culture as a whole but it's an issue within the English classes and so if, if what you're talking about, David, is how do we change the nature of, how do we change the culture um, and give students an understanding that this is a, a more pervasive thing. The thing that's neat about what you're suggesting is that you end up, you know, they have to claim some, they have to invest something in, the, in thinking through that issue of plagiarism. Uh, men mentally active about the issue. Right. Anyone can sit back and let the lecture just pass in and pass out. The tricky part is um, that I think the, for us, I think we've, in Hillier at least, we're finding it a little more successful to deal with the culture as a whole. And it's a statement, like you, know, you were talking about the raising the hand at convocation thing. It's, I think, equally as much of a statement for uh, a school to say, as a mandatory part of our orientation, you're, we're going we're gonna to take an hour of time or 45 minutes of time, and you're going to do this, this workshop. And um, I used to just, in each individual course that I taught, I would do a little thing on plagiarism, and I would have an honor code that I would have students sign. And I'm finding it... Um, a stronger mess. I, I do some of that anyway. I don't have them sign it, an honor code in my class, but I'm finding the message seems to me to be stronger um, and I'm getting less resistance from students. Um, I have, you know, plagiarism comes up for me also every semester. It's, um, and the students whom I've caught since this orientation workshop was started, uh, I'm getting f far fewer arguments from them. It's kind of like this thing, like the second you walked in the door, this is one of the messages we were sending you, so. But. Yes, Laura. I'd like to speak to that as well, coming from chemistry, because we deal with plagiarism as well, and we deal with plagiarism of data as well as plagiarism of language. And so I don't think that plagiarism can be, um, English can be the perfect fix to it. I think that everybody needs to deal with it. I talk about it in my science majors classes. I talk about it in my non-science majors classes. We talk about it extensively in the lab curriculum and talk about what are types of plagiarism, but we also talk about the fact that using someone else's data without their permission, with uh, using your own data and representing it as you collected it this semester, whereas you actually collected it a year earlier, is not ethical. And so you can't just talk about plagiarism in English and say that that's going to fix everything. And so I would be a fan of it needs to be across the curriculum. 
just to follow up, you know, I would like to imagine that once every student has this guide in the next academic year, the professors then start to bring it into their own classrooms and say, you know, with the exception of Hillier, maybe we can integrate that as well. The professors, as you're doing that conversation, begin to say, I know you received this in RLC 111, you've been, ta you've been talking about this, and this issue for science directly connects to page whatever, and so we begin to make that institutional message that we care about it, and that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, because students, you know, who are the egregious ones, think, well, I can slip it by, because they don't know what they're doing. And that's what I think David talking about, that sort of systemic solution is so important. It's not just a matter of individually we do something, but we have to have a better organizational system in place to not only you know, detect it, but then also penalize the students who are egregious plagiarists. And I'll make one last comment. When Laurel and Ella were so helpful to me preparing that PowerPoint, updating it from a presentation I did last year, one of the student workers over in the office heard about the topic and she said to me directly, do you know how many students I know who are plagiarizing and I'm so sick of it? Our best students resent the fact that we're not doing more as an institution and that's when I think it's very dangerous. Uh, Sherry? I, I would like us to also think about this in terms of an entire uh, culture, an ethical culture of the university. Uh, I don't think it is a, a separate issue from the issue of violence on campus. I don't think it's separate from the fact that our students throw trash in the hallways in their dormitories. Um, and even perhaps not separate from the students who are taking courses to get a degree. Just that. Why are they here? Well, what do I need to get my degree? What do I need to get an A from you? What do I need in order? Um, and, and when we raise, or when I raise a, a question to them about how would you like to become an educated person, they look at me like, what are you talking about? Why does that matter? I must. And, and we are, to some extent, giving them the message that this is a task for them to get through. There are steps that they must accomplish. And to be efficient, this happens to be one of the ways that you can efficiently operate in the world. Um, so I, I am really pleased that we're looking at this, but I think we should not try to say, we want you to be ethical when you write papers. Nuts to the rest of your life. Um, it won't make any sense to them if we don't expand the conversation somehow um, to looking at how we as an institution operate and how we want them to be in the world. Uh, and, and I think, you know, well, that's it. First, a quick hallelujah that this has happened. Thank you very much. It's high time. And the second thing is just a very quick anecdote about how very persistent this is. I make a huge deal about plagiarism. And one of my graduating seniors last semester came up and I caught her and said, yeah, I know you're anal about this. I said, duh. Then why did you still go ahead? You know, so that somehow it's so ingrained that they will do it despite the fact that the probability of being caught is extremely high. The main question that I have is, are next steps beyond this charted yet, or are we just talking about what else we can do? Because the idea of a systemic solution or some institution-wide thing at least, perhaps coordinating with learning from other institutions, is way overdue. And a specific question is, has anybody given consideration to or know about legal issues of privacy? Because if I tell another colleague, watch out for so-and-so, am I not in fact violating something? What about if somebody is a recidivist, you know, like a, a multiple sinner? Um, I know that because I report to the chair, the chair tells me and so forth. You know, what then do I do that's uh, okay? I was wondering, what does, what does integration actually look like? Um, and I was wondering, you know, Chuck um, Calarulli every year sends around the mid-semester academic warnings. 
where we're putting you know information in about students electronically, sending it off to their advisor, um, and they, I'm, but it seems like there are bigger legal issues involved when you're talking about something like plagiarism. So I'd be curious to hear, say, from from his office also, um, what possibilities we have for integration. Because I know in Hillier we we discussed this at a couple of faculty meetings. Um, even this idea of having, I mean, what we what we've come to is is somehow some some a, you don't want a database type thing where you can look things up, but certainly documenting it. If there are a way to document it more easily, um, would that help? Would, would 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 more people document it? Would more people follow up on it? But then you end up, you know, what we've ended up with is temp the temporary solution is you can let the assistant dean know, and you can put a letter in the student's file, and then if if something comes up for you in in a class, you can ask, have you seen any instances of this before? So it's very um, localized, you know. So yeah, but as soon as you get into systems, you get into real legal issues. I'd, I'd just be curious to hear a statement from Chuck on that. That is something I would pass over to the provost's office in terms of what, what would apply in that case. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, the FERPA laws are about directory information, and I can answer that about Blackboard issues and grades. When it comes to colleagues talking to each other and tracking, I don't feel like I have the um, authority to answer that. I don't know if Catherine would be able to address that. We thought of creating a, a bad list, <laughs> if I could call it that way. So faculty brought it up, and uh, it came back that we could not do this. The only way you could do it is for one person to document it, write it up in a letter, if it's if a warning or, but you have to, again, you can't just put a letter of warning in there without notifying, giving the student the right to take that letter off their file if they believe that this was a by error and you know there's recourse so you have to do that and if that letter stays in the file that it was documented for whatever reason and action was taken whether they agreed or not and the steps are taken uh, and then eventually that file should carry and that's the problem is right now the files will nestle carry from school to school but a faculty member if you are of a student in your class you're entitled to physically go in if that student is in your class at that point to check that student status that's all, except if there's no, you know, because academic files are about your academic standing. That's the only thing that I was told based on what we have for academic services at the Barney School of Business. The qu you had a question earlier I, I wanted to catch on. What, what was the... Uh, I, I, I was just making that point about the, about the whole ethical context. Oh, okay. Just, uh, again, Chuck Caroloni and I are working on the same concept. He wants to call in a town meeting mm -hmm. process where the goal is to identify 75 to 100 community stakeholders at the University of Hartford and get them in one room and use a Delphi method or something else for four to five hours to define what the university should stand for. Not just the issue of issues that surface substance abuse, ethical, behavioral, uh, anger, uh, disrespect, I mean everything from academic dishonesty from, you know, and so hopefully we will come up with a so-called list of eight to ten principles university principles that everybody will stand for. It's a big task, I know. But the process hopefully will help us do that. And we're also also interested right now in identifying stakeholders that have been disenfranchised by the university, meaning students, for example, who've left campus because they felt that the life was inappropriate. The ones who feel that they're very angry, like the person working for Laurel, for example, because she's so t tired and fed up of actually seeing people cheating. So we'll, we want the ones who are happy as well as the ones who are unhappy so we can really come together uh, as a community and then process this and come up and again, not necessarily focusing on the negative, what, is, what are going to be the good things, what are the great things, what, are the, what can we do better what, so eventually we come up together. Uh, the, the other suggestion I have, and again, I think in a systematic way, for example, Laurel could set up a Blackboard with every single user on campus. Now, what's the current rate of Blackboard uh, courses of How university? What's the university percentage? You know, we've never gotten the actual percentage. We're running about um, 900 course sections. Can you guesstimate what the number about of, of, you know, like is it 60, about 60, 70? Okay. Well, hopefully if we track and we're going upward, if you now can find a way of getting a certain, like close to what, 95% of the university population that actually has access to Blackboard, whether it's a faculty or staff, then you can actually have a plagiarism course. That every single person, graduate, undergraduate, faculty member, and then from there you have definitions and resources because then every single one of us in our syllabi can actually link it up and it says you must follow the university Blackboard plagiarism 
standard and that details out the policy that details out eventually how we deal with it also what we define as plagiarism because of course people can tell you hey it's a definition issue like the president you know regards to sex but but that's some students have that perception whether it's right or not so I think there are ways for us to do things um, so Barbara first in the, okay, just going back a couple of points um, when I teach about plagiarism in my class I teach it in the context of behavior academic honesty academic dishonesty and then look at some articles about behaviors in society they're not just about plagiarism to put it in a larger context and when I specifically teach about plagiarism, what I work with the students on is paraphrasing, giving them several different choices uh, to discuss which one is, is crossing the line, which one gets the idea, and then having them write paraphrases and trade papers and share them. Because I find that um, it takes a long time before this is integrated into their own personal understanding of what it is and how to avoid it. It seems to be totally new to a majority of my students. I'm Lynn Golden, Director of Learning Plus. We know that about 20% of the students on this campus have a disability. They don't all disclose, but that's the number statistically. Um, many of those students are truly ignorant about what constitutes plagiarism. And these are students who have come from a background K through 12 of having standards altered for them, legally altered, so that they can achieve success. So they come here and suddenly they find out that these standards aren't altered. Now for years they've been writing papers with mom and dad. This still occurs. In fact, I had a father call me not too long ago complaining that he had to write a paper for his daughter over Thanksgiving vacation because she had so much work she wouldn't have been able to visit with her friends. So he's calling to register that complaint. The best part is he called me back to say, that son of a gun professor gave me a C minus. <laughs> so, so we have students truly coming to us who are very ignorant ignorant about academic integrity, about what constitutes plagiarism, where they should go for resources. And I just want to uh, invite all of you, refer those students with disabilities to me. If you question the um, authorship of a paper, don't hesitate to call me if this student has disclosed their disability to you. Also one comment that David made, if I can make one other comment. Um, student Affairs has an on course, um, an online course called Alcohol EDU. And in order to uh, maintain housing on campus for the sophomore year, the uh, all first-year students have to take and pass this course. Now, I wonder if we could do something like that in terms of plagiarism and in order to register for courses for the upcoming semester or the upcoming year, have that be a requirement? Just something to think I think about. we have time for one more, and I think Rick has been uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least ask one question. I, you know, I want to echo that uh, comment about the difficulty of teaching paraphrasing. Uh, I think that's a really gray area. In fact, uh, I wonder if maybe somebody on the panel would like McDonald would like to comment. It seems to me that looking at the idea of patchwork plagiarism is really uh, one way to address that. And uh, I noticed I've read previous presentation on the FCLD website that Donna presented, and I know that jumped right out at me as a very difficult area. And, at RLC, we use something called a double entry journal. I'm also wondering if that could also be a very powerful tool against plagiarism. You ask the students in one column just to quote the source directly, and then in a second column to elaborate upon the source 
and basically do the type of thinking that's required then in the standard research paper, where then it's just a matter of you know including the signal phrase according to the author, and then you finish off the quotation or the paraphrase with that parenthetical citation, and then that second call becomes the elaboration. Another very good exercise is simply asking students to um, you know take source material, quote it, and, you know quote it and and plagiarize it. They go, what? And they say, yeah, I want you to deliberately plagiarize. Now I want you to quote it and cite it and elaborate upon it. Now I want you to do a third sheet of the same material where you then work from the source, paraphrase it, acknowledge it with a citation, and then elaborate upon it. And it does take, as you were saying, just repeated efforts of working with this for students to understand it. What I liked about this guide is it also then includes um, samples of you know, paraphrases that are too close or are appropriate. And so students then would get repeated uh, training in proper paraphrasing. It does take time for students to understand this. And they, of course, when they do that sort of plagiarism, it's they simply don't know how easy it is to slip in the signal phrase, the proper citation. They don't know how to take credit for the work that they've done in many cases. So it's something we do need to train repeatedly. And of course, we can't treat plagiarism like writing in general with some sort of vaccination theory that we'll just get one good dose of it in RLC 110 and 111 and we'll be set for the next four years. As long as we have that mindset, we're not going to make much progress. Thank you all. This has been extraordinarily productive. Hope to see you again at the next one of these we do.